Okay, welcome to chapter six. It's going to introduce our alkenes for us and um, a lot of the addition reactions that we can do with alkenes. We're going to turn them into multiple different functional groups. Um, and we're going to get started right away with a very simple addition of just a hydrogen halide. Uh, we're looking at the example being HBr at first, but this would apply to HCl, HF. So any halogen gets represented as an X. All right, we're going to see something interesting happen. When we react an alkene with an HX, we see that the alkene itself, and more specifically the double bond, will act like a nucleophile and attack the electrophilic part of the HX, which would be the hydrogen. And then the halogen keeps the electrons with it. So the hydrogen does indeed get attached to where the double bond is. And um, since that pi bond is going to break and those electrons are going to create the new bond, the hydrogen is going to end up with one of these two carbons because that's where the double bond was. And that's what we've drawn over here. We've actually attached the hydrogen here to the carbon on the left. And then this one we, or on the right, and here we attach it to the one that's on the left. And the other side gets a charge. And that's simply because it would no longer have a complete octet. We've created what we call a carbocation. And this is the two different ways it could form. Now, technically, we still have just a bromine floating around, but we're not going to do anything with that. We're focusing at first on the carbocations. All right, now we clearly see two different possibilities because the double bond has two, two carbons and we're only attaching the one hydrogen to it. So we are definitely going to get these choices. All right, the neat thing is, though, we're going to find that we don't always get both choices. Um, typically, one is more stable. And in this case, that top one is. The reason it's more stable is that carbocation, carbon with a positive charge, is never going to be very stable. But if that particular carbon that has the positive charge has three other carbons to it and is tertiary, we're going to find it's a heck of a lot more stable than a carbocation that has just two carbons attached to it, secondary. And just because it's more stable, it's much more likely the hydrogen is going to go to the side or the other side. All right. Now, speaking of the stability, we can actually make some safe predictions. When you are actually looking at your carbocations formed, tertiaries are always going to be more stable than secondaries or primaries or even the methyls. Uh, these guys are almost not stable at all. Um, so when you actually have a double bond that has uh, hydrogens off one side and not the other, you're going to see that the carbocation typically forms on the side without the hydrogens. So let's think about this. If HX adds an H in that first step, where, does the, where do you think the X is going to get added? So let's try to think this through. So I have this molecule here, double bond here, and I know it's going to give me one of two carbocations. And I'm going to draw them both. And I am going to leave this relatively complete. But where that double bond is, I'm going to do one where I draw the hydrogen on one side and the cation on the other. And then the other one I'm going to draw is just a, essentially a mirror of that. Still just a single bond here. This has still got an H, and that's a CH3. But on this one, I'm going to have the H drawn over here and make this the carbocation. All right, so which is a better carbocation? That one's a better carbocation. And X is going to be kind of a negatively charged species. It is now going to be a nucleophilic and attack that location. So in this case, we can actually kind of safely say it's likely that the X is going to end up attached to that carbon 2 position, at least on this molecule. And that is pretty much what we're going to see on all these. The very next step is, let me go ahead and show it, is the halogen attacks just the carbocation. All right, now, um, something interesting happens on that intermediate. What I mean by the intermediate is that carbocation, how we can predict which one is more stable and why. Now, there's a couple things to look at. We're going to first look at what the transition state likely looks like. And we can actually figure out what the Lewis structure of it, the actual Lewis structure of it, 
by looking at what the reactants are and the final product we get. All right, on that first step, we're going to take a alkene, and I'm going to just keep it something simple right now. And at the transition state, we will turn that alkene into something that has a hydrogen on one side and a positive on the other. That's our first step, and it's always the same. All right, let's look at our possibilities on the free energy diagram that we could possibly draw here. Now, I know we haven't talked about energy levels, but we could predict them on something like this. I have an alkene that's following the octet rule. The carbons all are all happy. And then I have a carbocation where I have one carbon that's definitely not happy. Well, just because of that, I can actually predict that the products are very unstable compared to the reactants. We have a situation like this green curve. So reactants are very stable compared to the unstable products. Well, the nice thing about the curves when they're done like that, they're, the curves are almost always shaped the same. And the slope going up and down is roughly the same always. It's a very even distribution. So what we can say is the peak of the hill is going to be the closest to the least stable uh, um, state. And since in this case our products are more stable, we know the transition state is going to be very close to this guy. All right, so what does that mean macroscopically? It means that our transition state, and I'm going to draw it with blocks, actually has that alkene with the hydrogen almost all the way attached before that bond really breaks or finishes breaking. So it's almost already there. So it's almost uh, the final transition state or the peak of the transition state looks much more like the products than it does the reactants. All right, so let's keep that in mind when we think about a competition. So what I have here is we took the same exact alkene and it was actually 2-methyl two or 2-methyl two propene and we could actually create two different carbocations. We could create that tertiary one or we can create this primary one. So we're putting the cation here or here. Well, we just kind of said that we want to make the more stable carbocation. Well, the reason that is is because the transition state looks very similar to this anyway. So in both cases, we're going to have the H almost fully attached. So we need to get it in there. And we're going to have the cation almost fully formed. So the stability of the carbocation is directly related to the stability of that peak. And what actually happens for us to help us predict the next step is the fact that since that one's so much more stable, we know the other one leads to a very high hill. So we can kind of guarantee that that's the one that the halogen is going to attach to. And that's what we see in the next step. We figure out what the most stable carbocation is, and the halogen pretty much attaches to that stable car carbocation. Okay, turns out it's not always the only product we get. On something like this molecule down here, we are definitely going to see where the H gets attached to the side with more H's and the halogen gets attached to the side with, more, uh, um, with less hydrogens. That is the standard. This is definitely what we're going to end up calling the major product. But whenever there is a chance, and what I mean by a chance, when both actually locations um, can form a carbocation, we do get mixtures. So I am going to have one where the Cl is on the side with the uh, carbon and the hydrogens on the other side. It's just not going to happen uh, the majority of the time. The major product, and it's always how we're going to call it, the major product, is where the H goes with the side with more H's and the halogen goes to the side with more carbons. There was a guy ages ago, he's Russian, Markonikov, that actually came up with this rule. And he was referring to the hydrogens when he said the rich get richer. The side with more hydrogens gets more hydrogens. Seems like a very uh, Russian communist thing to say, right? Rich get richer. Um, but that's going to happen with HCl, HBr, and HI. Um, there is a reason HF is left off this list, and we're not really going to talk about it in this chapter at all. Uh, but we are only going to do this with those three. Okay. We do get some uh, interesting little mixtures happening. 
So anytime I have a situation where I have the possibility of a tertiary carbocation, which is what I have if the hydrogen, if the carbocation gets created there, or a secondary carbocation, I pretty much end, end up with products from both. The major product is going to be following Markonikov's rule, rule. So that means we're going to put the H on the side with more H's. And then the halogen goes on the other side. That is always the major product. Now, we're never going to talk about percentages. We just say major and minor product. And even in the second one, the uh, cation is here or here. And since that's going to be tertiary, we're going to expect that to be our major product where the halogen goes. And therefore, that's where the hydrogen ended up going. All right, but we can always safely say major and minor on those. And this is a comb combination of tertiary carbocation and secondary. When you have those as your choices, you get both products, but the major product is going to come from the, from the one that created the tertiary carbocation. Now, if it's primary along with tertiary, something totally different happens. So I have the carbocation form here, which would be the likely one, and that is a tertiary carbocation, and we definitely see that. That is how we got this product. But this other location, it could have formed a carbocation, but that particular carbocation is primary, and it turns out tertiary carbocations are so much more stable that if you have that a first and a by primary and a tertiary, you never see the, the, the primary's product at all. About the only time we can get this to work with a primary um, carbocation is if I give it absolutely no choices whatsoever. So if I just do straight ethylene with HCl, I will indeed get CH3, CH2Cl. But as soon as I add a carbon to that, so if I take this to CH2, Leave that a double bond, CH, but put a CH3 here. So as soon as I add another carbon to that, I'm pretty much only ever going to see that Markonikov product. The primary carbocations are just too unstable to actually compete with the other ones. Now, the second one here is pretty much just what we saw, because we would have a tertiary carbocation, we'd have a secondary carbocation. You're going to get it both a major and a minor. All right, this next one's an interesting one. Let's look at this. So it's, it's just a two-pentene, but if you notice, both sides of the double bond have an H and have a carbon coming off of them, a carbon chain. Neither side has more H's. Because of that, neither side leads to the Markonikov product. In that case, you get a 50-50 mixture. You're just as likely to put the H on the left or the right. But in this case, you do get two products. So, all right, let's think about this one. What are we thinking we're gonna get here? I got HCl reacting with an alkene. So rather than just try to draw the answer, let's think about what the transition state looks like, or more importantly, what that middle step is, what carbocation we form. So which of these two locations has more hydrogens? Well, that only has one hydrogen, but over, there's two on this side. So I'm expecting the hydrogen gets added here, and that becomes the carbocation. And therefore, my final product, and I'll keep it drawn roughly the same, has a chlorine there. And I could have drawn the H off this, but technically that's now turned into a CH3. It was a CH2, and now it's a CH3. Now, would I expect the minor product? Well, the minor product's going to come from the other carbocation, which would have an H here and a positive there. And we have a secondary carbocation versus a primary carbocation. There is a slim possibility you would see some of from the one per from the primary, but it's going to be well under like, you know, maybe as if you got the temperature up high enough, you might get maybe 10% of that. So what we're going to actually say is for the most part, you do not get a product from a primary carbocation. So we are going to say that's pretty much the only product, at least for this one. How about this one? All right. Which side definitely has more hydrogens? 
Well, no. It's got to be this side because it's got two hydrogens. That's just carbons off there. So my carbocation, CH3, with the other side becomes the, get the positive. So my answer, and I have a chlorine coming off there too. Okay, that's our first thing. So I, I, I put this little symbol here because it's very important to notice that it forms a carbocation. So figure out what the carbocation is first and then realize it does make the Markonikov product. Markonikov just means the H goes to the side with more H's. Okay, the next addition is hydration. Now hydration in the real world just means water. Turns out it does this as well. Hydration of alkene means we're going to add water across the double bond. And when we add water, the H goes to one side, the OH goes to the other. All right, now these are what we're going to call acid catalyzed. And early on, we actually will see even here on this lecture notes in your textbooks, it just says H+. Turns out not any acid will work. Because really, if you think about this, if, if you were to say HCl instead of just H. HCl is an acid, but we just saw that HCl can add chlorine to it. That's a big reason why we don't do it. We actually end up using pretty much only two acids. It's H2SO4 and H3PO4. We're going to see why here in a second, why it's those two. All right, now here's the full mechanism. Now H2SO4 and H3PO4 are not drawn explicitly on here. What we have is the nucleophilic double bond attacking a hydronium. Now what's interesting, I messed up on this, this arrow. Um, the arrow is coming from the double bond, but it should be gone just to one of the hydrogens. Because that what, that's what gets transferred and we create a carbocation, just like we did with the HX, the very first reaction we looked at. And it leaves behind a water. The second step is kind of interesting because the water behaves like the nucleophile and it attacks the now electrophilic carbocation. And we get another um, anion. It's not a carbo, or we get another cation. It's not a carbocation because now the charge is on that oxygen. Heck, a lot more stable because of that. And we're going to have to do one more step where another water comes in and deprotonates that water that's attached to the thing to make our alcohol. So it's a three-step process, but the neat thing is we call it acid catalyzed because the acid we use here that gets destroyed, when we're all done with the mechanism, we make an acid again. So the reason it's called acid catalyzed is because you don't actually use up your acid. You just need to have a little bit in there, and that will just get this reaction going, and uh, the acid will be regenerated as the reaction goes forward. Okay, so... Backing up to our carbocation thing, um, that first step is just putting an, a hydrogen onto a uh, carbon or onto an alkene. So we do create the exact same carbocation. And matter of fact, this mechanism looks exactly the same as the first step of the HX. So we can clearly predict that we're going to make the carbocation that's more stable. So it is still going to be the Markonikov pro product. The hydrogen from the acid will go to the uh, side with more high H's, and the OH will go to the other side. All right, so do we only need a trace amount of acid? Turns out we do, because since it's acid catalyzed, the acid gets, gets used up in that first step, and it's produced in the last step, so you get back every bit that you put in. So just a trace is all that's needed to get this going. Okay. Excuse me. Turns out if I put a different alcohol in there or an alcohol in general in place of the water, I can actually have it behave like the nucleophile. So it still behaves exactly like we get. The H will go to the side with more H's, but what's attaches the second time is the O attacks the carbocation that was formed. The O from the alcohol. And then later on, uh, something will come in there and rip the H off whole mechanism looks something like this. So here we're showing it with the H2SO4. So the H2SO4 gets attacked. 
becomes HSO4 minus, um, and we make our carbocation. The carbocation gets attacked by an alcohol, and that should not have a backwards arrow. It's it, the, the lone electrons always attack the uh, positive, and we end up attaching a protonated or a cation on the oxygen. And in this case, we're just going to let another alcohol come in there and pull this H off. Again, that should just be a one-way arrow to that. And we get our final product. Now, this does not show the recreation of our starting acid, but that's because this particular acid is a strong acid. So the extra H that comes back out the end just goes somewhere else. In this case, it's easier to put it onto an alcohol than it would be to actually try to reform that strong acid. Now, here's why we end up using H2SO4. Turns out HSO4, being negative charged, would be a nucleophile. But that particular nucleophile is relatively big. Um, if I were to draw out the structure, I end up with something like this, with the H attached. And I have resonance between these three oxygens, so that negative charge is balanced out between all these oxygens. So what that does is it kicks away the HSO4 minus from having a strong nucleophilic attack point. And it's really big. This thing is too big to come in here and attack that nucleophile uh, or that electrophile. So I don't have to worry about the HSO4 being a nucleophile in my reaction. And the same thing happens with H3PO4. Both of those two acids are just big enough that we use them exclusively on acid-catalyzed hydration because they won't actually cause any weird side reactions. All right, so got two reactions. Got hydration, and we got HX addition, which is hydrohalogenation. Uh, both these create Markonikov products, where the H will go on to the side with more H's. And both of these on this chart say rearrangements, and I haven't addressed that. That's the next thing we have to talk about, because it turns out all of these, and it's going to be throughout all of organic chemistry, whenever you create a carbocation, you're going to have a chance that it rearranges. And what do I mean by rearranging? Let's look at an example. I'm going to look at the reaction of 3-methyl-1-butene with just HBr. So let's draw out 3-methyl-1-butene. There is 3-methyl-1-butene, and if I react that with HBr, I wrote that wrong, it should be a plus, plus HBr. I might be able to skip right ahead and say, well, I'm going to put the H with the side with more H's, so it's going to be on the outside, and the bromine's only going to be on that second one. So you might expect to get 2-bromo-3-methyl-butane. Um, All right. Turns out that's not our major product. Our major product on this particular one actually puts the bromine down here. Which, if you look at this, starting from the original product, the double bond was nowhere near that position. So how the heck did this bromine attack a cation that didn't even exist from our starting product. Well, turns out simple rearrangements happen with carbocations. What I mean by simple, technically speaking, that carbocation that we predicted created this thing did get created. And it looks very much like we'd expect right there. But this spot right next to it actually had a hydrogen. And that hydrogen is such a small atom and that bond is very attracted to that negative spot, that it essentially moves. These two play things essentially swap places. We call that a 1-2 hydride shift. Now, the reason they stress the 1-2 is it's not going to move a lot. We need the hydrogen right next to where the cation is. If there was something else there that's not a hydrogen, we actually can't move that carbocation. So you need to have a hydrogen to do the hydride shift. But it's going to happen all the time. So uh, the, fact, the fact that this is a secondary carbocation, but the hydride shift gives me a tertiary carbocation, we're going to see this happen all the time, and that's going to lead to our major product every single time.
it's such a strong motivation, the car stability of the carbocation, that small alkyl groups will move as well. There is a chance that a single methyl could shift. We just call those methyl shifts, one, two methyl shifts. There are other rearrangements. You're going to see them in your textbook if you go through the pro problems where we might take like a four-membered ring that has an alkene on it. And you might find when it's all done, it's turned into a five-membered ring. Um, when our book introduces these, they want you to come up with the mechanism to show how that change occurred. Um, that's about the only way you're going to see that on the test is you're going to see the starting reactant. You're going to get to see the starting product. And I will be asking you to do the mechanism. So study these methyl shifts and hydride shifts. This is not quite a methyl shift, but since that ring has a lot of strain in it, that four-membered ring is able to open up very much like the hydrogen is shifting or the methyl is shifting. Okay, so rearrangement stability really only affects that adjacent location. This particular alkene, we could have formed the carbocation here or here. And since that's secondary and this one's primary, we're going to expect just this carbocation. All right. This one is not going to make a hydride shift with this location to the left, because if it were, we'd still have a secondary carbocation. So it'd go from a secondary carbocation from a secondary carbocation. Neither one of those is more stable. So it's not going to shift in that case. So even though this has that methyl way down there, and we'd love to have a tertiary carbocation, we simply can't shift the carbocation charge that far. It, that just doesn't happen. It only goes about one location. There are times in rings, just like I was showing on there, where you'll get a bigger shift. But all of the times you're going to see that in your, any time in this class is I'm going to show you what the starting reactant is and what the product, and you're just drawing the mechanism to connect the two. Okay, let's see if we can predict this. All right, so since I see it's just an HX being added to it, I don't want to immediately just try to draw the product. Whenever you see a product like this, go ahead and draw out the carbocation that would be most stable. And I sometimes draw it so I'm drawing both locations to remind me. Now, I'm looking at that and I see secondary and primary. So I know primary is not going to be anything. So that's that's not I'm not worried about that. But this secondary location is very close to this tertiary location. So I just got to ask myself, does it have a hydrogen on there that can shift? And that one does. So I would suspect or I would expect this one to do a hydride shift and put that carbocation there because now it's a tertiary carbocation and the hydrogen that was here moved up here. And then I'm going to come in there and put my nucleophile on that location, the bromine. All right. How about this one? Similar type of thing? Maybe, because I got a tertiary group here. All right. But we're not going to draw it straight away. We're going to look at the carbocation that's formed. And just like before, I'm thinking about both. And I can immediately put a no through that because it's primary compared to secondary. But I can't move this one all the way here. I could only move it here, which would still be secondary. So I'm not going to get a shift. So in this case, we're just putting the bromine on that location. Okay. Next thing I want to look at is something that we kind of glossed over intentionally. The fact that this actually creates some stereoisomers. Now, this molecule is the exact same thing we just did. So before I talk about what we're going to do here, I'm going to back up to this. All right, reason I'm backing up to this, if you notice, if we were to ask this final product, does it have any stereoisomers, you would actually be able to say that that particular carbon is asymmetrical, and so is that one. Now, it's not drawn in any way to let you know what's going on, but there are stereoisomers there. All right, so I want to look at this particular one here, and the first thing I'm going to do is just get rid of that first stereoisomer, the one that my starting reagent started with, and just look at this. And I want to know, does it create a stereoisomer as it reacts? 
All right, the carbocation would actually likely to go here. So, and it's not gonna rearrange because there's no nothing but secondary carbons. So I'm expecting this to be my answer. All right, does it have an asymmetrical center? Yeah, that particular location would be asymmetrical. It's got four groups coming off there. Hydrogen, obviously, that was on there is not drawn, but it is asymmetrical. Okay, here's something neat that happens, though, that actually uh, is going to tell us what isomer it is. Our middle step was a carbocation, and it always is on these first two reactions we're looking at. The stereo, uh, the uh, geometry of a um, carbocation is always trigonal planar. And there's a p orbital going up and down through that plane, which is what that bromine attaches to. So if we think about it being a nice little trigonal planar flat ring with a p orbital coming up, the bromine could have come in from the top or the bottom and made that connection. And because that happens, this is always a 50-50 mixture of R and S. So you get an antimers. All right, now the one I drew, you're not gonna get an antimers. All right, why is that? Well, let me draw this, it's two different ways. We could have had that bromine wedged forward or that bromine wedge back. That would show the two different ways that we make this R and S, right? I don't need to figure out which one's R and which one's S. I know those are mirrors of one another. All right, but that happened because this HBr reaction created that stereocenter, and it always creates that 50-50 mixture. All right, but this particular molecule had an uh, had a um, methyl group already attached. I didn't do anything at all with that in the reaction, so that is the same way each time. That I did not affect it whatsoever. It's rigid. So in this one, it's actually this re these reactions. It's kind of safe to say if when you create a stereocenter in the chemical reaction, you are going to create a 50-50 mixture. But if the molecule has a stereocenter in it already, it will pretty much remain unaffected. This particular one gives us a pair of disteromers. Because the bromine is reversed, but the other one's kept the same. All right. Let's look at some more stereochemistry considerations. I have slightly bigger. 3,4-dimethyl-3-heptene. Ooh. And I am just going to draw just carbons. Two tennis. So 3-heptene, three, 3-4. Okay, do I have a Markonikov product? No, neither side of the double bond has more hydrogens. So what that translates to, I have two potential products. And I'm just going to draw both of them with that exact same background bone. So one more carbon. One, two, no, I drew too many carbons. All right, so I have HBr or HBr. And I kind of expect a 50-50 mixture of these two because neither one of those is a Markonikov product. However, this one's going to make a, a big mixture. Because if we look at this, that particular location is asymmetrical. Got a hydrogen, got this long chain, got a methyl and a methyl. This side is also asymmetrical. You created two stereocenters in that reaction. And more interesting, you created both stereocenters. The H created the first one, and it could have been R or S. The H either attacked the top of the double bond or the double the double bond you created R and S at that in 50-50 mixtures. When the bromine attached, it wasn't dependent on anything that happened here. This was turned into a trigonal planar thing, so the bromine also created R's and S's. So 
whatever this thing is fully named, you're going to have RR for each of them. You're going to have RS, you'll have SR, and you will have SS. All four of those would be present in roughly equal amounts. And technically the same thing down, happens down here. So look at the mess. If you were to mix these two together, you don't get just a major and a major product. You don't get a 50-50 mixture. You will have eight different molecules because this is RR, RS, SR, and SS as well. You would have eight different molecules in there, all in roughly equal amounts, one eighth each. Um, but you created both stereocenters, so you actually created this mess of things. It happens. I need you to be aware of that happening. So that's why we're talking about the stereocenters here. All right, so I'm going to add to our chart. We got the rearrangements here, and we're going to come back here. There's a reason this is kind of grayed out. We're actually not going to talk about the peroxides present given us anti Markonikov until we get to our radicals chapter. So even though this chapter deals with all alkenes, it will not deal with everything that we're going to do with alkenes over time. We aren't going to do anything with the peroxides until we start talking about the free radicals. All right, but this hydration, we're going to do a couple more things to it. Turns out there is a way to stop rearrangements with hydration. There's actually two go-to mechanisms. One is oxymercuration, demercuration. You get the Markonikov product on that double bond, and there is no chance of rearrangement, so the H and OH go exactly where the double bond was. Hydroboration does the same thing, but it always gives us the anti-Markonikov um, product. All right, let's look at these two so we can see what's going on, because there's also another little line here, the sin and anti. Uh, turns out that's going to help us predict the stereocenters in a reaction. All right, so hydroboration is the first one we're going to look at. And it's a very simple two-step process. BH3 and THF are going to be used to react across the double bond. And what gets attached to the double bond is that BH3. It goes on as H on one side and BH2 on the other. And then we're going to actually use basic hydrogen peroxide to replace the BH2 with just the OH. But the end result is hydration. Now, the reason we do this, it does two things that are very beneficial for us. First of all, it's always going to be anti-Markonikov. Um, we're going to see why in the mechanism, but we are going to find that the BH2 likes to be with the side with more H's. That's what makes it anti-Markonikov. The sin addition is also kind of neat because what that means is the orientation of these two are dependent on each other the H and BH2 go on the same side of the double bond. And because of that, if this is R or S, this one's fixed to whatever the definition of that was. So if H, or if, if the BH3 gets added to the other side of the molecule, the only two options you have are to swap where the H and OH is. So you would always get the mirror or the enantiomer of the uh, final product assuming it has a stereocenter when it's done. All right, let's look at the full mechanism. First thing we're going to talk about, though, is the BH3. We will never just say BH3. Um, it's always going to have this THF with it. Now, the reason that is, turns out BH3 will dimerize with itself, make this B2H6 stuff, and then might just blow up. It's toxic, it's flammable, it's explosive. You don't ever do anything with straight BH3. What we do is we store BH3 in tetrahydrofuran. Now, the tetrahydrofuran is that molecule right there. The reason I bother to draw out the structure is because the name might throw you off. You see tetrahydro, you're thinking four hydrogens. Well, this one has eight hydrogens. All right. The tetrahydro came from the fact that this molecule over here is furan. Furan has double bonds in it. Furan already has hydrogens in it, has four. But if I add four more hydrogens across these double bonds, I get tetrahydrofuran. All right. Biggest reason we use it, it's a stabilizing ether, but it actually stabilizes the BH3. And they can be stored together. No, no worry about the uh, um, explosive gas. 
All right, so we might show VH3 in the uh, mechanism, but we are always going to draw it with THF. But what we're seeing here is the mechanisms, and we can see what's going on. Uh, what happens is the BH3 uh, attaches across the double bond, almost lined up with one of the BH bonds. And the boron, being kind of big, is going to get to the side that it can get easier, closer to, so it's going to go to the side that has more hydrogens. And we form this weird little four-membered ring at first, and then the ring kind of shuffles bonds around. So the, all the bond breakings happen simultaneously. So we break the pi bond, break the um, BH2H bond, and form a CH bond and a CB bond all at the same time. And we get our intermediate that has the boron on the spot where we eventually want to put the hydroxide. And then step two of our oxidation, we just have basic hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, with some OH in it. And that is what's going to swap out the BH2 with the OH. And you like the lack of mechanism? That's done on purpose. Uh, don't worry about the mechanism on this particular step. Okay, let's see if we can predict this. BH3 with an alkene with our OH in it. All right, I do know that because of Markonikov rules that I'm going to add the OH to the side with more H's. Deuterium is just a tag to actually distinguish itself from hydrogen because I don't want to have hydrogen and hydrogen next to each other. So if that is going to be deuterium. This is CH3. But Markonikov tells me that I'm going to put the H with the side with the CH3 and the OH with the deuterium anti-Markonikov. Now the other thing I know, the BH3 gets added on on the same side, so the HOH are on the same side. So I'm going to make them on the same side by wedging those two. And if I wedge those two, the methyl and the deuterium must be in the back. You're going to get that, and it's an antimer, where the H and OH are in the back, and the CH3 and the D are in the front. So, And rather than draw out the structure, I'm going to say plus an antimer. All right. Oxymercuration is kind of interesting. Our Brucey textbook doesn't list it at all. Now, the main reason they don't list it is because of the toxicity of mercury, and it doesn't always give us a benefit because it gives us the Markonikov product. So if you have a double bond with one side having more H's, turns out the mercury goes to the side with more H's and the OH goes to the other side. And then the NABH4 rips off this mercury and you get your H's. So you get the Markonikov product. About the only reason we bother to use oxymercuration at all anymore is if I am worried about that double bond moving. So if I had something like so on this group, I would have to worry about a hydride shift making a tertiary carbocation and then the OH would have added to that tertiary. So if I guaranteed I wanted to actually add the OH to that Markonikov position, I'd have to use the mercury alternative. So mercury acetates, the stuff we use, is actually a great substance to do that with. Now, biggest reason we don't want to use it. In my mechanism, we're going to see, see that. All right, so the first step is to actually attach the mercury to the um, uh, alkene, and it is mercury acetate. It actually can be written as just HDOAC, or that's the ion that gets attached. The original stuff is OAC2, mercury 2 acetate. And you will sometimes see this drawn as just HG, and then people just write out what the acetate is. Because obviously that's a little bit more um, familiar to you from general chemistry than that OAC. All right, but the HGOAC actually forms a weird three-membered ring, and it is stable. It is isolatable. That We don't have to worry about that falling apart. But that actually makes this whole ring electrophilic because of that positive charge. And in our second step, a nucleophile will just attack the back side of that ring. 
and the nucleophile is going to go to the side that it can get to and form the more stable complex. So it's going to go to the side with more, uh, with more carbons or the side with less H's. Now another advantage of this, in this last step, when the mercury gets ripped off, the hydrogen that gets on here is going to add to the same space. So since this OH added to the opposite side of the mercury, you are always going to be on opposite sides of the molecule. It's an anti-addition. This is going to do something similar for us on the, on the uh, stereocenters as the hydroboration did. If you create a stereocenter, the other thing that you would have created is its perfect enantiomer. You will not necessarily be creating disteromers. All right, but here's why we don't typically use this in modern chemistry labs. When you treat that mercury-containing salt with the uh, sodium borohydride to actually put the hydrogen on there, that is your final product. And it does everything we want. It's a wonderful product. But this produces quite a bit of mercury. And mercury being mercury, we want to avoid contact and use of it as much as possible. So we don't typically see this get used very often because of uh, the, the nature of mercury. However, it's the only way to actually get a Markonikov product without rearrangement, at least this early in our organic chemistry um, education. Okay, so let's see if we can predict it with the mercury acetate. Neither one of these will really have mechanisms, so you typically are just going to actually have to come up with the final product. All right, so I'm going to draw these two just like they were. And I know since this is uh, um, the mercury one, I'm going to end up adding the H to the side with more H's and the OH to the other side. All right. What the anti tells me is that if I place the OH up, I would have to place the hydrogen down. They are anti to one another. That, in this case, makes the deuterium go up and this methyl go down. But we're also going to get the enantiomer. All right, this is something interesting. Now, the borohydride one doesn't give us this much of an option, but the mercury one, we can swap out the water added in that second step with another nucleophile. And if you put an alcohol in there, you will end up attaching an alcohol instead of, a, or you'll end up adding the OR rather than an OH. So it gives us an option of a way to make an ether. Um, that is a Markonikov product. All right, let's do a stereochemistry consideration with the hydroboration of another one of these things. Now, I actually made this one a little bit different than the previous one. It's still crazy heptane. I don't know why I did heptanes. And a three methyl. And we're going to do hydroboration. So, hydroboration is two steps. Step one is TH. F with some BH3 in it, and step two is basic hydrogen peroxide. Comma there, that's an actually a dot. All right, now I know because it's boron, I'm going to end up adding to the H the side with less hydrogens, and then the OH gets sided to the other side. So I'm going to end up with. OH and H. All right, that's my final product, but this says something about stereochemistry. Suddenly I care about the stereoisomers. Turns out that is an asymmetrical carbon. And this is an asymmetrical carbon. All right, but I'm not going to create disteromers here because that first thing that happens is the BH3 goes on one side and one side only. So the H and OH ended up added to the same side of the molecule each and every single time, which means I'm actually going to create this one and its stereoisomer. So it's an antimer. But I won't be creating any, any uh, disteromers because the stereocenters we create are dependent on each other. So there's really only one choice. You're either attaching to one side of the molecule or the other side, 
and you're doing that at one time and creating both those stereo symptoms. All right, rather than try to figure out what the rotation is on this molecule, because it turns out I kind of needed to have drawn this with cis or trans to actually see it. We're going to look at a slightly different one here in just a page or two. Yeah, it's going to be on this next little section because it turns out this is going to do something very similar to the mercury one. All right, so back up here. Talking about our summary here, we have our two things that also do hydration. One always gives us the Markonikov product. One gives us the anti-Markonikov. And the syn and anti talk about how those two groups are attached, the H and OH, that is. All right. Halogens can be attached across the double bond as well. Um, Cl and Br will go without any issues whatsoever. Iodine will sometimes work. But for the most part, we're actually only going to really do this with chlorine and bromine. And we will find that we always get the same thing. See how these are actually opposite? We always get an anti-addition. The first one gets attached, and the second one gets attached to the opposite side all the time. We can see that if we look at the mechanism, what's going on. Now, I do have another problem with the arrows here. The double bond attacked the bromine. And this arrow is going away from the double bond, from the bond between the two. Because the bromine gets attached as a electrophile, because it's the electrophilic. We're going to say one bromine is electrophilic compared to the other one. And the other one takes the electrons with it. But this bromium ion is what actually creates the, electrophil the electrophile for the second step. So it's like cation, but the charge is on a bromine. The other bromine, the negative charge species, will attack the opposite side of the ring. And that's why we end up with the bromines anti to one another. All right. Now, here's something that's interesting that happens. We're going to keep this simple with just some cis and trans molecules. Straight, straight cis and then tra straight trans. Now, if I do the bromination to a cis molecule... I'm going to end up drawing it something like this. Now, you saw what we've, what we've done is we basically said bromine here and bromine here. So the CH3s are still coming at us. The Hs are still in the back. And we just have the bromines in there. And then to turn this into a um, Lewis structure, remember how Lewis structures, the backbone's always going into the paper? They essentially just rotated this so we could see that the... Um, uh, methyl groups are going into the paper. Well, right now they're coming out, but that's why the bromines ended up opposite one another. This is kind of like the top and bottom. And we get the enantiomer of that all the time. So we are going to get two different mixtures. So even though um, cis kind of has a mirror right down through the middle of it as the alkene, it loses that mirror because the bromines add on opposite sides. All right, now, if you have a trans one, which definitely does not have a mirror down through the middle, when you add the bromines here, top and bottom, think about rotating the bromines so they're on the same side. You see the methyls are even on the same side. You get a structure more like this, where the bromines are definitely on the same side. But this has a mirror plane. In this case, if we use that symmetrical trans molecule, we get a mesostructure. Okay, um, something we do in the lab when I was a student to test for alkenes was to add bromine to it. Because the interesting thing, bromine has got a very deep um, reddish brown color. But if I drop it into a liquid that has alkenes in it, it will add across the double bond and you will lose that, um, excuse me, reddish brown color. So a test for double bonds was simply to add a bromine to it. And you could even do this with like oils. You know how we have saturated fats and unsaturated fats? Well, unsaturated fats, if you add the bromine water to it, the bromine would disappear. Now, we don't do this too much in the real world anymore because bromine's borderline toxic and we want to avoid contact with it as much as possible. And we have spectrophotometers that can see double bonds so much easier and you're not destroying your sample. So I actually could take this original starting alkene, put it in the right spectrophotometer and actually 
visualize the double bond. I mean, well, the spectrometer is visualizing it. It's absorbs light in the ultraviolet range different than most other bonds in a organic molecule. All right, so that's the uh, halogenation. Uh, it turns out that that cis-trans thing is what applies to the mercury acetate uh, for the um, hydration. All right, what's next? All right, we're going to tweak the um, halogenation some. So halogenation added the two hal halogens across it. What we're going to do is let that happen first, but we're going to leave another nucleophile in there. So rather than just have bromine in the reaction uh, um, arrow, Underneath it, we're actually going to say, well, we're going to leave some water in there, too. Turns out water is such a better nucleophile that it's going to be the other one that attaches. So bromine will add to one side and, and hydroxide will end up on the other. Now, what's really weird about this, when we first introduced this, we say it's Markonikov and anti. Well, the anti is easy to see because it's happening the same way. Bromine forms that three-membered ring, the bromine ion and then the nucleophile attacks the opposite side, so those are going to be anti. The Markonikov's a little bit harder to do, at least not right away, because if you stop and think about what Markonikov said, he said the rich get richer, hydrogen goes to the side with more hydrogens. I didn't add a hydrogen in this case. I added a bromine and an oxygen. All right, so what do they mean by Markonikov in this case? Well, we just got to stop and think. Uh, the nucleophile is attached on the second step. That second step needs to be attacking a stable carbocation, or at least a more stable one. And what makes it more stable? Having the charge on something that's more substituted. So when they say Markonikov here, it's the halogen that's acting more like the hydrogen. The uh, water is still the nucleophile. So we could safely say that Markonikov rule, which says hydrogen goes to the side with hydrogen, also kind of says the nucleophile goes to the side with more substituents. And that's what's happening here. The nucleophile attacks the side with more substituents, which is why we call this a Markonikov reaction. All right, let's see if we can predict this. All right, now all I'm doing here is I have chlorine and H2O2. All right, so it's that same molecule I've been using, got the deuterium and the methyl. All right, which side's getting the chlorine now? Yeah, it's going to go to the side with the hydrogen. And therefore, the OH is going to end up on the other side. I know it says water, but we're going to deprotonate it later on, right? All right, and I know that the OH and the Cl are opposite one another. So Cl must be going down, OH must be going up. Therefore, in this case, the CH is going down and the deuterium is going up. And just like before, I'm going to get the enantiomer of this. All right, what's next? Turns out there's more than one thing to do to change the nucleophile. So that previous reaction would have happened with both bromine and chlorine as that first step. So Cl2 or Br2. Well, what happens if I kind of mix them? I have Br2 and I have chlorine floating around, or Br2 and Cl2. Well, we will end up with mixtures most of the time. But it turns out that second step, so once we create that bromium ion, the nucleophile floating around in there, in this case, we'd have Br- minus and Cl-, minus. the stability of our um, anions from that group one is kind of related to their acidity. And if you remember, HBr is actually a stronger acid than HCl. And simply because of that, Br itself is more stable to float around in the solution. That means chlorine is a stronger nucleophile. Now, it's not super cut and dry. If you really did this in the real world, you're going to end up with a lot of mixtures of things. The bromines and chlorines will actually even in some cases totally replace each other. So you might have situations where we have two chlorines attached to the molecule or two bromines attached to the molecule or one of each. But the majority of it is going to have the chlorine 
because it's a stronger nucleophile on the more stable location and the bromine at the less, less stable position. All right, that is halo-hydrin reaction. Halo for the, hal for the halogen, hydrin for like the hydration. All right, next thing we're gonna look at is epoxidation. Now in the real world, we probably have heard of epoxides. We end up using them kind of like glues. Uh, they, they use to join things and, and make pretty surfaces. Well, all the epoxides are, are um, three-membered rings with an oxygen in there. Uh, the reason they're used the way they are is because that is very reactive and opens up and typically bonds with others like it. So it kind of like polymerizes. But you have a lot more control over how it reacts than just straight polymerization, which is why we end up using it for various other things. Well, we're not actually doing anything with the epoxides. Our lesson on this is how to make them. And we're gonna make them from alkenes. Now, all of the common ways to make epoxides involve a molecule like this. Now, that's not a typo. It's not a carboxylic acid with an with a extra O to put in there accidentally. It's intentional. This is a peroxy acid. It's got a peroxide aspect to an acid but that part is what's necessary to make this epoxide. Now, the two go to R groups is just a straight benzene, which gives us, oh, PBA. And then the MCPBA has a chlorine over here. Both of those are the go-to ones. They're matter of fact, they're so darn common that your book is going to actually have this reaction drawn a lot more like so later on. So let me redraw that starting molecule. And they're not going to draw this out. They're just going to do PBA. And then they'll draw something like that. Very quick, no mechanism really drawn out. Just saying PBA, you make an epoxide. All right, now mechanism is known. Turns out for certain the oxygen that's closest to hydrogen and that um, COOH aspect is the oxygen gets transferred to the alkene. The transition state does look like this, but all these bonds that get broke and all the ones that get formed all happen simultaneously. It's what we call a concerted reaction. It happens in one step. But the gist of it is our peroxy acid gets turned into just a carboxylic acid and our alkene gets turned into an epoxide. All right, before we do anything, we got to name these because it turns out so far, this is the only functional group we've really created that's truly new. Everything else was ones we've seen before. Epoxides often get named with um, common names. So even though they're not IUPAC, you will see them a lot. And to name an epoxide like you uh, with a common name, you name it as if it doesn't have an OH or doesn't have that ring in it. You name it like, well, let's just pretend this was a double bond there. So that's ethylene if it had the double bond. And since it has the epoxide where the ethylene is, we call it ethylene oxide. Isn't that weird? Just add the word oxide. And that's telling you to draw the alkene and then put an O on it. And where that really comes from, um, ages ago, when they actually first started talking about epoxides, you would see them drawn like this, where they were drawn as if the oxygen was bonded to the pi bond. And it really was because so much of the early epoxides were derived from alkenes. So they thought there was some kind of relationship to that. All right, the IUPAC nomenclature, there's two ways to do it. It turns out the three-membered ring with oxygen in it is called oxirane with an I-R-A-N-E. And specifically, that would be the number one location. So everything else is just a branch off the ring. So if I did that first one like that, that's why this is 2-ethyl, because 1, 2, 2-ethyl two oxirane. Here we have 2,3-dimethyloxirane, and here we have 1,2,2, two, two, so 2,2-dimethyloxirane. Two, two, 
right. The other name, we're going to name uh, the epoxy just with the epoxy no, uh, prefix. So epoxy is just the O attached to two different locations. And to specify what the two different locations are, you actually number both locations. So this backbone is just butane, and there's epoxy off the one and two. Backbone is a butane, epoxy's off two and three. Backbone is a propane, and you have a 1,2 epoxy and a 2 methyl. All right. Stereochemistry when it comes to epoxides is a little bit easier to see because this will probably make a little bit more sense if you think of it three dimensionally. The pi bond has a top and bottom. We're going to add the O to the top or the bottom. So if you start with a cis molecule, you still have a cis molecule. If you start with a trans, you still have a trans. Adds to the top and bottom. All right. Now, epoxides right now, um, the only thing we're going to do to them is open them up with acids. And more specifically, we're going to open them up with any acid. There's a positive missing here because we're going to have that epoxide, uh, slightly uh, electronegative nucleophilic O, attack an H, and we're going to make this OH, and this is going to now be slightly positive, which makes this ring positive. So even though this was nucleophilic, it's now turned into an electrophile, and this oxygen from the water now attacks the opposite side. So our second step has that turn into, and I'm going to just draw this mostly the same way, but we're going to break this bond. These two are still here, and we're going to have an OH attached down here. It's going to go on at first as a water, and then we'll deprotonate it. We form a trans diol, or an anti-addition of the OHs. And right now, that's all we can really predict, is we're going to add the OHs on opposite sides. Now, we don't have to do this in two steps. You don't have to do it where we make the epoxide and then you use an acid to open it, if you use a specific pair of acids. So, uh, peroxyacetic acid is where that R is just a CH3. And formic, or peroxyformic acid, that R is just an H. But if you use either one of those, they actually have the proxy acid for it, too. And the carboxylic acid that's left over has a high enough pKa that it will cause that ring to actually get the, the um, diol added. Okay. So we got the epoxidation, and we're talking about opening it with acid to form a trans diol. Next thing, oxidative cleavage. This seems weird, but all technically we're going to do, let's say I have something with a double bond, and I will just put H's over here because it's simple, and I'll put methyls over here because that's simple. Oxidative cleavage just means, like with ozone or KMNO4, we're going to break the double bond. Now, with the ozone analysis, we break the double bond, and on either side that had a double bond, we just put an, an O, so this side become, has double bonded to an O, and the other one is still double bonded to an O. And that actually looks something like this. So we create an ozone, a, a ozonide, which isn't very stable, three oxygens in a row, part of a ring. So that ring will rearrange itself, and we get something more like this, which is the ozonide. Now, the ozonide is relatively stable, but if I put it with some dimethyl sulfide, that will actually break it down and turn it into our, our um, carbonyls. Now, it won't do anything else to the things off to the side. So if these were R groups and hydrogens, they're still R groups and hydrogens. And even if I do a relatively big molecule... All we have to do to plan this is just draw a little line through all of your double bonds. So I have one complete molecule, which I'm going to draw down here and put a no on it. 
then this thing's going to come up here and here. It's going to have two double bonds in it still. One that must have an H because that was an H. And one that has an H or has a CH3 in the backbone. That's still another O. And then this other thing we're putting down here, we're putting O and that H that was drawn there. Now, ozone analysis is kind of finicky. have to keep it ridiculously cold. And dimethyl sulfide kind of stinks. So this would not necessarily be a fun one. So KMNO4 can be a little bit easier for you. Because it turns out KMNO4, we can do this at room temperature. Matter of fact, we're probably going to have to heat it up a little bit. Um, and you can actually tell it's working because KMNO4 itself dissolved in water has got like a little purple color to the liquid. And as this reaction happens, it'll turn into a black fine powder. Um, pain in the butt to filter out, but you can tell it works. Now, it is slightly different in how it behaves. So if I start with that exact same alkene that I introduced before, I'm going to see a slightly different result. And what I'm going to do here at first is show that, that uh, when it reacts with the hot KMNO4, any side that has carbons on it, those sides stay exactly the same, and the O gets attached to the double bond. So that looks exactly like what you'd expect for O's analysis. If there's a carbon, you get the exact same thing. On the other side, though, I had those hydrogens. Um, H is attached to carbon, get oxidized with KMNO4, to OHs. So anytime you see an H, it's turned into a carboxylic acid type thing. Now this is a very particular one. If we have a CH2, um, turns out that's just carbon dioxide dissolved in water. So it actually turns into carbon dioxide gas. So your sample would actually bubble off carbon dioxide. And with my bigger molecules, it looks something like this. We're going to imagine breaking along the double bond. Since that's a carbon and that's a carbon, we're just going to add an O. This one is a carbon and a hydrogen. We're going to leave the carbon alone, but turn the hydrogen into an OH. This one's a little bit com more complex because our cleavage is going to open up a ring. So we're going to have one continuous molecule still, but this is going to get an O attached. When we come up here, this is going to be an O, but now it's attached to an OH. And I rotated the structure when I did this other branch because it would have come up here and bumped into this one. So I rotated that down. And technically, this other side did create a second molecule, but since it was a CH2, it bubbled off as CO2. Okay, cleavage, oxidative cleavage, can be done with ozone or hot and concentrated KMNO4. And you get similar reactions unless there's a hydrogen attached directly to where the double bond was. And then the uh, ozone keeps it as a hydrogen, the KMNO4 turns it into an OH. All right, one of our last things is one of the first things we introduced in the last chapter uh, with regard to a reaction. Alkenes can go through hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is just the addition of hydrogen across the double bond. Now, we left it kind of as that first little equation at the top. I did mention it had a catalyst because that's what we're talking about. Well, it turns out the catalyst, because it holds the hydrogens on one side, kind of guarantees that the hydrogens are added to the exact same side of the double bond. So we call it a syn addition. Uh, whichever orientation is created by the first hydrogen on there, the second one's dependent on it. Now this is an interesting one. Even though it creates a very specific rotation, we have a few things we can pull out of it that help us understand some of the later on chemistry things. Like for instance, these four molecules, three molecules, sorry, actually have the double bonds in them. And uh, when we react it with the hydrogenation, we get the exact same molecule. Now, we saw this in the last chapter, and we used it to explain why um, a more substituted alkene was more stable. And that's what they're still showing here. 
that particular carbon has more carbons directly off the double bond. It only has the one hydrogen. This one has two hydrogens. This one has three hydrogens right off the double bond. Um, the lower energy is more stable. So we use that to talk about stability. And we actually were saying something like this. A more substituted alkene would be more stable than a less substituted alkene. All right, but if you think about it, there are two different ways that we could have put two carbons on or two R groups on there that aren't listed. And they are trans backbone and cis. And if you think about it, is there much of a reason to think they'd be exactly the same on the substitu substitution? Probably not, just because if you think about adding to it, those hydrogens are going to be in less your way in one case than the other. And that's what we actually see. When we do the hydrogenation of a transbutene, we actually see a um, sign of it being more stable compared to the cis version. So see how the energy is less, 27 versus 28? Um, that actually tells us that the trans version is more stable than the cis version. And generally speaking, the cis version isn't much different than the version that has our, the two R groups on one carbon rather than one of each carbon. So that just adds to this page. We can put this particular one right between these two, and we can set this one kind of equal to that one. All right, here's something else we can find. Even though hydrogen adds across the double bond on both sides, and because of that, when this created a stereocenter on this location right here, with hydrogen by itself and just a standard catalyst, we'd expect an into, uh, we'd expect a mixture of enantiomers, both R's and S's. Well, it turns out we can tweak our catalyst. This particular catalyst, which is this thing down here, has an actual stereocenter to it. Um, it's stereocenter based on how rigid the molecule is put together. This bond right here doesn't it isn't able to freely rotate because it, the groups bump into each other. So that bond forced an R and S in this whole crazy molecule. Well, this stuff um, forms a complex with ruthenium, and it serves the basis of a catalyst. But because the catalyst has a stereocenter, has a specific uh, uh, ratio, it actually only gives one particular stereoisomer of our sample. Now, we're not going to do much with this mechanism. We're just introducing this because we want you to be aware that there are stereosymmetric or stereoisomer cat uh, catalysts that create stereoisomers when they actually react. And this whole area is blown up and there's a lot of ex a lot of actual different techniques out there that take advantage of this concept. A lot of the reactions that use catalysts that we're going to see throughout the semester, you can get catalysts that are stereospecific. All right. That gets us the rest of, um, oh yeah, popped up down here. I didn't see it because it's overlapping there. So H2 should be down a little. This should just say other nucleophiles. It looks like it says other hydrogen nucleophiles, but other nucleophiles and hydrogen should be separated. All right, last little thing I want to point out. Um, we are going to have to revisit alkenes more. Now, I already told you about this thing up here with the peroxides present. You get the anti-Marconikov, and I just left it in there to point it out to you. We're also going to expand on this area with the epoxides because it turns out there's more way to open the epoxides than just with acids. And it turns out that cold KMNO4 does a heck of a lot different than hot KMNO4, even to um, alkenes. So we're going to revisit both of those in Chapter 11. So this does get expanded. I have it here, but that's stuff that's part of Chapter 11. Or I think it's Chapter 11. It's whatever the alcohol's chapter is now. I'm pretty sure that is still Chapter 11. All right. Now this page talks about all the little differences on the enantiomers and the diastereomers we created from the different reactions. So think of it as a summary. There are plenty of problems in your textbook, and I have 
been adding problems to your test bank for your practice quizzes that have a bunch of these in there as well. So a lot of chances to practice the stereochemistry and how they affect it. Um, and I have been trying to get it where I have very few possibilities. So not like the example I have in the textbook in the uh, lecture notes here that had eight different mixtures formed. But I think I have one that's only four and one that's actually only two. Um, but um, make sure you uh, um, read up on this and give it some practice because I know we didn't cover it much on this lecture note to really build up on this. Didn't do enough examples. All right. Thank you very much.